Coming up on the program, we're going to talk about how to properly store your harvest. We'll also discuss and talk about the fight against chemicals. We're also going to have guest Brock Hughes from Canada, and he will talk all about hydroponics and also when to know when your tomatoes are ripe. All that and more coming up today on the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener podcast is permeating into your ears with your host, Joey Bear. And it could be the weeds. Some gardeners try to get all the weeds out of their garden. Other gardeners leave them in their garden. It's really a decision that you need to make. There's benefits to both sides of that. It's just something that you need to figure out what you want to do for your garden. And Holly Bear. Canning is a science. When you're canning, you want to make sure you follow the directions, follow the recipe, don't cut corners. Don't replace things. It's crucial to you, your health, and your family. They're professional gardeners with full-time jobs. And they're on the air now. Welcome to the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Podcast. A podcast for all levels of gardeners. Welcome to the program. Traditional ground gardeners, raised bed gardeners, container gardeners, and anybody and everybody in between. I am your host, Joy Baird. Beside me is my wife, co-host, and best friend, Holly Baird, behind the TWVG microphone here at the WI Garden Media Studios in Southeast Wisconsin. The information that you're going to hear is important and vital to your garden. You just may have to tweak some of the dates and times that you applied for, for best results. If you're tuning in, you most likely know who we already are. But if you don't, welcome to the program, and you can find all previous podcasts on our website at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com. There's a podcast tab at the top of the page. Click that. We've got a lot of information. A lot of great guests have already been on this program. And if you don't know who we are, we'll tell you a little bit about who we are and what we do, and then we'll get into how to best store that harvest that you've worked so hard to get. We produce weekly, several weekly videos on our website, the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com. These are videos ranging from short, couple-minute videos to longer, multi-segment videos that we do weekly. In addition to that, we also have our quarterly digital magazine. This comes out every three months. It's a high-quality, full-color magazine. For free. For free. On our website, under the magazine tab, and that's something we do as well. In addition to this podcast, where we can share the information that we have with you in a different format. You can take us along with you. You can download us. You don't have to view a screen. You can go on with your daily activities and still listen to what we have to say. So let's talk about, let's get into the program, and let's discuss about proper ways to store your harvest. Now, there, first of all, there's many different methods of storing the harvest. We, we've talked about this on the program in the past, maybe not in this much detail, but you know, there's canning, there's preserving, there's water bath pressure canning, and, and there's a difference on that. There, we've got a podcast mm-hmm. uh, all about canning, but real briefly, Holly, for those who maybe don't have time to go back and find that or listen to it, briefly, nutshell, difference between water bath canning, pressure canning, and what you need to do and not need to do in those situations. Sure. So water bath canning is for high acid foods or foods that have the addition of acid. So for example, that would include things like tomatoes with the addition of lemon juice. Um, green now, bean, now like r- real quick, pickled. we got a question about that. Is it necessary to add lemon juice if you're pressure canning? True enough, you need to add it if you're water bath canning, right? To tomatoes? You tomatoes, mean? yes. No, you don't have to add it to pressure canning. Water bath, yes. Yes. Okay. But we add it for just the security of knowing that mm-hmm. there's enough acidity in that. Mm-hmm. Okay. Go ahead with the, the description there. Okay. So, I'll start over. Okay. Water bath canning is for low acid, for high acid foods or things that have the addition of an acid. So, like I was saying, tomatoes with the addition of lemon juice. Or if you do like pickles, like pickled cucumber, pickled beets, pickled anything. Um, jams chutneys, jellies, marmalades, all that stuff, that's what you want a water bath can. Pressure canning is for low acid foods, so if you're just canning green beans without the addition of acid, um, carrots, corn, any of that stuff, potatoes, those are all low acid foods that need to be pressure canned because it gets them to the proper temperature 
to be able to be canned properly. Now, is it, you know, you can't pressure can or you can't water bath items that you need to pressure can, but can you pressure can those items that you are required to water bath? You know, yeah. Okay. So, uh, well, I'm not really 100% sure if you would want to try to pressure can jam. That would be kind of... That would be a little odd. Yeah, I don't know if it would Okay, work. but in some cases, yeah. they're interchangeable. And for some things. For some things. So be very, very sure about what item you're going to preserve in a jar, whether it needs to be pressure can or water bath can. Now, some people don't want to deal with the pressure canning because they've heard of these horror stories mm-hmm. of canners exploding. Yeah, that, that's not really a thing anymore. Um, as long as you follow directions and are careful and are aware and conscious, you would have a le- very some chance of it exploding. But still, you, there, there is, you should go get your canner checked mm-hmm. yearly, just like you would get an oil change in your car. The yeah. same, free. Because there's like gaskets around the... The lid and stuff and rubber things. And, and you may look at it going, oh, this is okay. But there's people, uh, you want to c- contact your local extension office who know what to look for mm-hmm. that you may just glance over and think it's okay. But it, it can be a, a severe, uh, very dangerous mm-hmm. uh, thing. So <clears throat> we've talked about the canning aspect. Of it. Let, let's talk about uh, items that you don't have to do anything with. You just cut them off the vine, bring them in. And store them. Let's talk about like winter oh, yeah, squash. Winter squash. So that's stuff like spaghetti squash, butternut squash, acorn squash, um, any of the winter squashes that you that you grow. I think that one banana squash, Bana- uh, pink banana, pink giant banana squash. Yeah. Now the difference between winter and summer, and many of you who are listening know this already. The difference between winter and summer squash. Majority of winter squash are vine. Mm-hmm. And they have a cavity of where the seeds are at inside of it. Summer squash, like your zucchini, has seeds intermingled in the actual ve- the, the vegetable itself. There's not a cavern where the concentration of seeds are located. Right. And the winter squash stores much, much longer than the summer squash does. Yeah. So let's talk, let's, let's uh, go over some of the um, ways to best store this because this is one of the easiest way e- easiest items that you can store whether you purchase it from a farmer's market in the fall from your local grocery store or you grow it yourself there's zero zero maintenance that needs to be done no, so what you want to do is you want to make sure that it's a, a cool dry place um, it's kind of dark but not super dark you know that there's some air circulation no direct know. sunlight yeah no direct sunlight and that there's good air circulation around it. So you wouldn't want to like put in a plastic bag in the back of a closet. If you were to have to put it in a closet, maybe you would want to kind of put it, put them separately away from each other. Uh, under uh, people who live in little tiny homes or apartments, under beds, yeah. under your couch, farthest away from a heat source. Now there is a certain time, a certain amount of curing, which simply means you bring it in after the harvest. Now sometimes whenever you buy these, some of these are already cured. You bring it in and you allow the skin to thicken or harden slightly to create more of a barrier for the internal material that's inside that particular item. Mm -hmm. And then it will actually store longer. You're looking at a typical winter squash, six to eight months, somewhere in that range, based on the conditions. Now, if you have a root cellar, if you're you're in a very cool basement of like 38 to 45 degrees, they're going to keep much longer. Uh, but many of us don't have the fortunate uh, availability of a root cellar. Uh, many of us may not have a basement of that coldness. So we want to keep this all in mind. And uh, that that's one way to store these, these winter squash. Now, we've had pumpkins that have lasted a year and a half. Mm-hmm. We've had butternut squashes that have lasted 14, 15 months. So you want to rotate this stuff out, obviously. Uh, we didn't do those intentionally to see how long can we make this last. It just happened that way. So that's some other ways to uh, har- store your harvest. Now, you can obviously dehydrate. Uh, you can obviously freeze. Mm-hmm. There's some things that, based on the item that you're harvesting, there's a certain procedure uh, steps of uh, that you need to follow if you're going to freeze it. You just can't 
pull it off the vine, throw it in the freezer. No. Talk about some of the, these different methods or uh, standard operating procedures that need to be followed to best uh, prolong the the life of that item that you're freezing so you can enjoy it in the winter. Sure. So for a lot of things, you have to do what's called <clears throat> excuse me, blanching or parboiling, where basically you boil it for, uh, you kind of cook it, not quite cook it, for just a couple minutes to 30 seconds, depending on what you're wanting to freeze. And then you put it directly into an ice bath to stop the freezing. So, for example, green beans, it's like 30 seconds. Uh, corn, it's like a couple minutes. So it really just depends on what it is that you're doing. But all you have to do is just go ahead and do that. And then you get it ready for freezing, and then then you're ready to go. And sometimes, and from our experience, you can pressure can green beans. We've tried that. Mm -hmm. We've water bath green beans. We've made dilly beans. Mm -hmm. And we froze green beans mm -hmm. and uh, removed the air and put them in a freezer airtight bag. We found the freezer, freezing them, made them taste the best mm -hmm. at the time of serving. Yeah. And this is personal preference. But again, there's different, you know, you want to look at what you're wanting to do on that. Right. So, yeah, so there's that, there's that too. And there's dehydrating, which mm -hmm. many of us know that what that is. You're, you're removing the, the moisture, the, the, the water. Now, you can store other stuff besides just squash. Well, you know? true. You can store the carrots. Um, carrots and potatoes. Mm -hmm. And how do you do that, Joey? Uh, carrots, you can take a big box of sand and actually put the carrot in the sand you want to cut the tops off and just bury the carry in the sand, and it mimics as if it was in the ground. Now, the Amish have been doing a, a different type of storage of carrots. Many of the Amish communities don't have electricity. So what they do is in the fall of the year, where their carrot patches, they will take leaves and mound leaves three or four or five foot tall over where the carrot patch is. Then throughout the winter, this keeps the carrot at a very cool temperature but it doesn't allow the carrot to freeze in the ground. So when they want fresh carrots, they'll go remove leaves, dig carrots up, cover the, cover the rest of the carrots back up, and then you've got a natural refrigerator that keeps the carrot cool but not frozen by using these leaves. And this can, be work, this can work for parsnips as well, as well as, you know, Jerusalem artichokes. If you want to go that way, cut the tops off and then mound leaves over top of the Jerusalem artichokes to allow those of us who are in the northern climates to continue to harvest off of these even though it is 2 or 3 or 10 degrees below zero. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, and potatoes can kind of be kept, well I've never heard of it being leave them in the ground you can dig them up and then put them in a dark cool place. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we've actually pressure canned potatoes and that's worked very well yeah. because you don't have to be concerned with leaving them in the cupboard or in the in a root cellar or crawl space, and they get wrinkled, and then they become uh, less appealing when it time, comes time to eat. So this is just some of the many different ways that you can store the harvest that you've worked so hard for over the summer months. Coming up next, we're going to talk about what we really think and the war on chemicals right after this. <laughs> If you could double the life of your raised bed boxes by sealing the wood with a non-toxic wood preservative, would you? Well, now you can with a clear, penetrating product called Internal Wood Stabilizer. It's 100% non-toxic and easy to apply. Seal your bare, untreated wood surfaces, even chicken coops, by spraying Internal Wood Stabilizer. It's invisible, seals the wood from the inside out, and never wears off. Recommended by organic gardening experts. Internal Wood Stabilizer. Check it out at TimberProCoatings.com. Do you want your next raised beds to be easy, functional, and beautiful? The Embrace helps you create the garden you've always wanted. Finally, raised beds that everyone can assemble and enjoy. No tools needed. Just slide any lumber into the Embrace corner, fill with your favorite soil mix, and you're ready to plant. Made from 100% recycled steel right here in the USA. And a portion of every sale helps to build school and community gardens all across the country. Let the Embrace help you create your next raised bed. Grow beautifully with the Embrace, available at local garden centers and online at artofthegarden.net. 
Paradigm Garden, Wisconsin's largest progressive gardening center. Located in Madison, Wisconsin, Paradigm Gardens offers the largest selections of soil amendments, organic and salt-based plant nutrients, grow lights, and hydroponic systems available in the Midwest. Our knowledgeable and experienced sales staff are always available to help. Visit our new website, www.paradigmgardens.com, or visit our retail store at 4501 Helgeson Drive, Madison, Wisconsin, just off Stoughton Road. Hey, Scott Poirier here with GottaGrowIt.com, and i got to tell you, I'm like nuts over anything you can grow out of the soil and eat. I'm all about growing food successfully. Currently, you're listening to Joey and Holly Baird on the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Podcast. Welcome back. We want to encourage you to check out our sponsors there. You can find more information about them on our podcast tab, located on our website, thewisconsinvegetablegardener.com. We encourage them, you to support them as they support us. Now, we've never asked you ever to buy anything that our sponsors offer, but we encourage you to at least see what they have that may make your gardening experience more successful and easier. Well, it's come to that time of the show where we uh, talk about open and candid about a topic, and this segment is entitled... Tell me, tell me, what tell me, what you really what you think. Really think. So this week, it's about trying to understand why food is so cheap. And I'm not talking about the junk crackers or the tin chicken McNuggets that you buy at, at the, the, the King's restaurant for $1.49. Because mm-hmm. we all know that that's just junk. Mm-hmm. I'm talking about you buy a pineapple for... Well, a pineapple takes 18 months to grow in Mexico, uh, I think possibly Southern California, Hawaii for sure. Mm-hmm. 18 months to grow. They ship it 3,000 miles to northern United States, and they sell it for like 99 cents on sale. How is any? How is that even possible? And I'm not talking about... It's a great deal if you love pineapple. Mm-hmm. It's a great deal if you love pineapple. But I'm looking at it from the perspective of the farmer who has spent time, effort, money, labor producing this. Now, I, I, I'm sure there's a few farmers who have, have had this thought, but many and almost all farmers or people, children who are growing up, they never say, I want to be a farmer so I can be a millionaire. People decide to be farmers because they want to get in contact. They want to be part of the land. They want to be part of nature. They want to work with nature. And, and I'm not talking, we're not going to discuss the GMO farmers versus the urban farmers versus the okay. urban ur, urban organic farms. I'm just one label farmer. Farmer grows food for people. That's just how it is, okay? If you want to go on a little rant about a GMO or a big ag farmer versus an urban organic farm, that's fine. That's your deal. I'm just talking in general. In general, the brown, the, the, the labeling of a farmer. How is, is that, that pineapple that is now 99 cents at your local grocery store or a buck 29 or even three dollars if that was true charging what that pineapple is worth that pineapple would be worth somewhere around 35 or 40 dollars a, a, a pineapple to to make the make it worthwhile uh, NPR did a story not too long ago that farmers in Southern California were taking loads and loads semi fulls of greens to the landfill because they were almost they had bagged them and they were going to go bad before they would actually get to the store shelves or the price was so low that it was they were going to take they were going to lose more money by shipping it to the stores than they were actually just taking it to the landfill and dumping it now we all know that there are one out of every four ch- ch- uh, children in the United States and for those of you who are listening outside the United States the statistic is of children go to bed each night without proper amounts of nutrients. They don't, they go to bed hungry. And all this food is going to waste, okay? I, the the farmers are not making the money um, that I think they should. I grew up on a farm. I understand that this industry uh, did it for many years. Uh, Now, we all remember, or many of us remember, that Super Bowl commercial sponsoring Dodge. I forget who the announcer was, but he said, 
a farmer works 72 hours by noon on Tuesday, and then he finishes his, then he works another uh, four days or something like that. It, that's I'm paraphrasing, but the concept is that farmers work hard for very very little, and that's what confuses me about how something can be so cheap but take so long to grow and be shipped halfway across the country. Right. And, you know, it's it basically, like you said, our, who's taking a hit here? It's certainly not going to be, I don't think, the grocery store. It's certainly not going to be the, the transportation company. It's the farmers. Uh, back in the mid to late 90s, if any of you were farming at that time in the hog market, hog market was good. Hog market... Uh, uh, briefly, uh, I won't get into too many details, but back in let's say ninety six, ninety seven, you could uh, a, a hog that you, you know you get you buy pork at the store, a hog that you would take as a farmer to market to slaughter, averaged about two hundred and fifty pounds. That's what the stockyards that was that's what the butchers wanted. You were selling those for seventy to eighty cents a pound. Well, about ninety eight, ninety nine. Uh, the pork industry realized that they wanted to get rid of a lot of independent farmers and brought in these massive uh, massive hog farms, commercial hog farms that had 100, 200, 300,000 head of hogs. And what that did to the market was whenever you slaughter 100,000 head of hogs at one time, the market's flooded, the, the butcher shops... Uh, doesn't want anymore. The slaughterhouses are, are at capacity. They've met their quota, and they don't do anymore until the demand comes back. Well, then that seventy cents per pound hog, within six to twelve months, became as low as six cents a pound, and it drove a lot of people out of the business. Uh, we had at one point, you know, our friends around us had a uh, twenty-five, thirty head of hogs. We had upwards of, uh, we were running for, uh, we were running 2,200 head of hogs. That's from every, from the little baby ones all the way up to, to the, the sows or the mother pigs and everything in between. And back in those days, you needed 35 cents to break even. And for many years, they, my family now has gotten out of the hog business. We were selling them for 25 and 30 cents because we had to move them because it was going to cost us more to get out of the industry than it was to keep, stay in the industry. So as you, a consumer, went to the store and you bought that two pork chops for two ninety eight, whether the hog market was seventy cents a pound or at six cents a pound, you never saw the effect whatsoever. It was the farmer who saw that effect. And at one point in the mid nineties, we as a family on the farm had one of the we were in the top five largest family owned hog farms in the state of Illinois. So. The, the consumer never really sees that price, price gouge or deficit as the farmer has. So that's that's my rant. Yeah, well, that's just it, is that you don't realize. You go, no, not the average person. Now people live listen to this podcast who grow food and, and stuff. You might realize that, that there is a, a price to every, you know, a, a price cut or whatever there is, or a proverbial price to what you're paying when you pay for that 99 cent or... Dollar fifty pineapple, but the average consumer, I'm not sure if they realize that. You know, I, <clears throat> you know, you can buy right now. You can buy corn for five dollars a dozen if you go to the farm stand in the farmers market, but that's because it's you know that old saying a dime a dozen. But come winter, you're not going to be able to find it that cheap. And so I think the best thing to to say here is to think about where your food comes from and maybe think about how. Go back to the idea of eating seasonally, where you eat what's seasonal, or what you've put up for winter. All right. Well, we've ran much longer than uh, what we anticipated, but it was worth the the, the uh, open and, and candid uh, discussion. So we'll close the door on this topic. All right. So we'll talk about the war on chemicals. And when I say war on chemicals, you instantly think chemicals you spray to kill unwanted weeds. You think of, as we talked about a little bit in that last segment, the big ag farmers, okay? But there's a lot of other chemicals yeah. that we come in contact with a daily base, on a daily basis. Some we have no control over. Uh, car emissions, uh, 
power plant pollution. Mm -hmm. Stuff well, we don't yeah. d don't have no control over. A lot of the uh, non-organic, I guess is the term, uh, skincare products yeah. have a lot of chemicals in them. Mm -hmm. And Holly, you can talk more about that particular uh, aspect of it than I can because you have you look at what's in this stuff that you're rubbing on your hands or or your, your face right and that's very true um, there's a lot of chemicals and in, in skincare products and yeah you know it's nice to have soft skin or wear makeup or whatever um, you know not be smelly whatever you want to think about but there is um, there is a price you pay for that and you are this the skin absorbs things faster than anything else in your body. It gets your bloodstream stream quicker through your skin than it does through ingestion. So when you think about that, if you say you go to the store, you just pick up a bottle of lotion, um, whatever, uh, generic brand, whatever, you're like, I'm just, I just need some lotion. So you say, this is the one I'm getting. I don't really care. I just need to have lotion. Well, before you know it, you know, not saying that this is going to happen to you, but it seeps into your bloodstream and that those chemicals do go through your liver and they, it has to filter them out. So just think about that. Um, you know, same thing with shampoo, uh, toothpaste, any of that stuff, especially the fluoride in toothpaste. Mouthwash. Yeah, mouthwash. Um, fluoride was used back in World War II to... In Nazi camps to to give in uh, yeah. to, to suffocate them. Not, no, not to suffocate no? them. Which, to, what are we talking about? To kind of give them uh, a euphoric feeling. Okay. Yeah, it's kind of sedative, and so you know it's in your water, it's in your toothpaste. It's not. It's been proven time and time again that it's not good for you. Uh, I'm not trying to scare anybody, but that's something to think it's about. It's the truth of the matter. Yeah, it's the truth of the matter. If you're giving your kids toothpaste with fluoride in it, you might. You know, just want to think about that. Well, and, and you look at, you go, any one of you who are listening, go back into your family's history and look at the ages that your great-grandparents and great-great-grandparents, if that information is, is, is available to you, and look how old they were when they passed away. Many, and, and there's, there's situations for everything, many of them were very, very old. Well, what, what did we not have 100 years ago? 150. Chemicals. Chemicals. We didn't have um, funky water. Right. We didn't have junk food. Mm -hmm. We didn't have Wi-Fi or cellular signals that are wafting through the air that I'm sure has not a good effect on any of us, mm -hmm. even though we love the modern convenience of being able to be connected to anybody at anywhere at any time. That just they're, they're, that just cannot be healthy for all of us. Not a scientist, not a not any of that. Just one person's thought on this. You take micro signals and throw them through the air. Can't be good for what our body's absorbing. No, not necessarily chemical, but I'm sure it, it can be loft into that and category. And then, okay, so say you're not rubbing on your body, you're not eating it. Um, is it is it in your plastic bottle? Is it? on, you know, what what kind of coating is it on that you're cooking with or drinking from or eating from that. That nonstick coating that flakes off into the food. Yeah. What What is that? Yeah, it's, it's probably not good. And, and now it, we've all done this. I'm not saying that we've not done that. No. We've all done that. We've all been there. We're just making this aware again because we do forget about these right. things. Then there's stuff like in diet soda, there's the aspartame. And it's not good for you. I, I know for a long time I drank diet soda. And and um, it's it's a neurotoxin, which means that it goes directly to your brain and it's toxic. And there's a reason. If any of you have ever quit diet soda and tried it again, it I know I know you know what I'm talking about. It tastes funny. And then sometimes you, feel, you don't feel good after you have it. So that's just something to keep aware of, be aware of, and think about things that we maybe just glass over and not even pay a bit of attention to or put a concern with a sp uh, on a daily basis. So that's just something to keep in mind. Coming up after the break, we're going to have Brock Hughes here. We're going to talk about hydroponics, growing in water, and some other great information that he's going to provide 
it may be, it may be an activity that you might want to start looking at over the long cold winter, right after this. Kapow is an American company that grew out of the need to develop an everyday product that would help us decrease our eco footprint. Utilizing the mason jar as its foundation, Kapow has created accessories turning your mason jar into a multi-use device. Drinking lids and lunchbox adapters, plus so much more. Made entirely in the USA from carefully selected food-safe plastic that is just the right thickness for both durability and ease of use. For hot and cold beverages, certified safe for all ages, and dishwasher safe too, get your Kapow accessories. Visit Kapow. It's all about the soil at ManureTea.com. With their grass-fed, antibiotic, and growth hormone-free cattle and horses, owner Annie Haven puts the quality in her premium soil conditioner. 100% organic and natural, whether feeding your flowers or veggies, indoors or outs, you can grow organically with confidence. To purchase authentic Haven brand Manure Tea, small orders or large, go to ManureTea.com. Always free shipping! At DollarSeed.com, all of our seeds are only a dollar a pack. And we have online resources that teach you all about the rewarding hobby of growing your own plants, flowers, herbs, and vegetables. Imagine the joy you'll feel when your children actually help you harvest your first garden crop. Or the pride of knowing you'll never need a florist again. Visit DollarSeed.com and grow a little magic of your own for just a dollar. DollarSeed.com. What could be healthier? Hello, everybody. I'm Farmer Lovejoy, host of The Dirty Cultivator, a podcast show where farmers can be heard promoting the consumption and importance of more locally grown food. And I'm Carrie Kay. Don't forget to listen to our Northwest Perspective at The Dirty Cultivator. And now let's get to the garden with Joey and Holly Baird on the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Podcast. Welcome back to the program. If you want to check out the sponsors, you can go ahead to our website, the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener. Well, Holly, let's head up to Vancouver, British Columbia to talk with our next guest. He is the host of a YouTube channel entitled Hydroponics at Home. That link will be in the show notes for this program. Brock takes us uh, on his journey and informs and helps his viewers grow hydroponically from the start to the finish. He shows his mistakes and what to do to correct those mistakes we're going to talk about a lot of things hydroponically, and we're going to be uh, schooled in this area because we're not that very knowledgeable about it. Welcome to the program, Brock Hughes. Hey, hello. Thanks very much for having me on. It's great. You're very, very welcome. Well, Brock, now a lot of people choose many different methods for growing, and you have chosen hydroponics. Why do you grow this way and not in soil? Well, Holly, I uh, originally... I had uh, been growing in soil, and I was living in an apartment at the time. And uh, my my landlord was kind of cautioning cautioning me, uh, you know, about the weight of all my pots up there. Uh, so I just started messing around with the hydroponics, and it just kind of took off in my life. I I I, I just I just love it. I I found that it was for myself far uh, easier to uh, work with, uh, you know, say 10 gallons of water that I could recirculate uh, than huge pots and, and lifting and going in and out with dirt and everything. So uh, I just got it going. And then later on when we were in the house, I, I just, you know, wanted wanted to have food downstairs under lights. Uh, but I found that when I tried it with soil, at least indoors, I wound up with a lot of, a lot of troubles uh, with all kinds of things. It's fungus gnats at first and but, you know, just a lot more press. So I uh, brought the hydroponics uh, indoors and uh, got it going in there. And it just kind of, yeah, it's just taken off like a fever in my life. I, you know, <laughs> it's kind of, you know, that's, that's sort of like my main focus in life these days. Now, there's a lot of terminology that's used in hydroponic uh, growing versus other means. Uh, we're, I'm going to throw a couple of out there for you, and if you can kind of explain to the listeners what those terms mean uh, so we can all kind of be on the same level. Uh, NTF. An NTF. An, an, an NTF uh, stands for Nutrient Film Technique, and uh, it's nothing more than either having a long tube uh, a long flat gutter system. Uh, it can it can be anything. Uh, it's generally generally seen in a tube shape, and uh, you'll see many tubes in a row. 
uh, the nutrients are pumped from a, a central reservoir and they're pumped up to the top of the tube where they gently come down and drain out of the other end of the tube and then go back to the reservoir. They're just pumped out in a very thin film, and this is, uh, this is where the film technique part of the, uh, of the NFT part comes from. It's a wonderful system of growing. Um, you know, uh, yeah, I, I, I've, I've grown in it many, many times. I, I grow mostly leafy greens in it, though, myself. Okay, one thing that you use and, and we see uh, many times on your program is the double dutch bucket system. And, and, and this, this has been around on YouTube quite a bit as well, but if you can explain that type of technique. That is my absolute favorite system for growing. And, and doggone it, I mean, you can, you can grow anything this way. Uh, it is uh, nothing more than a reservoir. Uh, of, of uh, how many gallons that's completely up to you and to how many buckets you'll have so uh, for six buckets I run a 15 gallon reservoir and <clears throat> the nutrients are pumped up uh, by a main supply line and into these various buckets now the buckets the double dutch bucket is a bucket that is nothing more than a bucket with a drain hole drilled in at a, at a uh, 90 degree that comes out and empties down into a return line that goes back to the uh, back to the uh, reservoir. The other portion of the bucket that slides in it is an identical bucket, and they just happen to mate because of the ridges. Uh, ridges they leave about a two inch gap below that can be used for a, a, a water reservoir. Uh, the uh, the inside of that bucket has been all drilled out, sort of perforated, uh, so it's sort of like, not quite like a sieve, but <laughs> uh, quite a few holes in it. And uh, th the nutrients are pumped over the top, and uh, they just drain right back down, and they come circulating around and around. So as you're measuring your nutrients during the week, you can uh, you can monitor exactly how much nutrients the plants are are uh, are uh, uh, consuming the double dutch one a, a lot of guys including myself used to use a single uh, dutch bucket uh, i i got away from those simply because if something went wrong with the double dutch bucket i can just slide the other bucket right out and i have other plants already ready to go in uh planted in buckets just waiting so it's kind of like a a little uh, <laughs> a little a little assembly line if you will Okay, now we have listeners from all around the world. And is there any wrong time or right time to start hydroponics? Is there a you know, is it a seasonal thing? Like us, for example, we grow in the spring, summer, fall. Is this a, a kind of a year-round thing? Well, you know, Holly, honestly, it, it, depending on your location, it, it, it is a year-round thing. I, I know guys in Florida, uh, guys in, their, uh, in Arizona. I know people in Australia. I mean... All over the world, with with beautiful climates, you know, far more than mine, that don't have such a distinct winter, you know, uh, snow and, and and things like this. So yeah, you can grow year round like this. Um, uh, I could even grow here. Uh, I tried it one year. Uh, it was extremely expensive for me to heat heat my greenhouse. And what I found in my my location, you also would have to supplement the light because you know it, we're under cloud cover most of the time. But just depending on, on if you can keep that greenhouse warm, uh, yeah, any time of year. Um, I, I just absolutely love it. In, in the summer, uh, it's a little challenging, you know, to kind of keep it, keep the roots cool. But uh, off into fall, you can start warming the reservoir and keep them going that way. So, yeah, absolutely. Any time of year, if, well, if, if you can grow it outside or in a greenhouse in a pot, you can grow this way. Now, Brock, you've done this a number of years, and you've talked to many gardeners from around the world. What have you found to be the biggest mistake that most amateur hydroponic growers uh, do? <laughs> the same, yeah, it, it, you know, this seems to be uh, this seems to be the same uh, the same repeat. For me, it was uh, overfeeding, uh, just too much love. Uh, it just, <laughs> you know, it, it, I did that when I was growing in soil, and uh, I, you know, repeated that when I got into hydroponics. And I found that, you know, through doing this year after year after year, 
in hydroponics, when it comes to feeding, less is actually more. Uh, so that 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 would be the most common mistake. Uh, people just have a tendency to overfeed and uh, not pay attention to the pH. Uh, the pH is absolutely critical to pay at attention to because if your pH is out, it's sort of like just taking back half of the food. Uh, it, it, it makes it not available to them. But I'd say that's the most common mistake, overfeeding. Now, you grow in hydroponically as well as you grow in coca corn. Do you have a preference that if you could just strictly do one all the time that you would go, or, or is both of them have their, are their positives and negatives? Well, you know, I, uh, if, well, you know, doggone, I don't think I could go either or because I love it. I love them both. Um, in the cocoa coir, I really, really love the uh, amazing root development that you can get going. So I, I like to use the fabric pots, and uh, the cocoa coir and the fabric pots I find amazing because, you know, the root structure just, gosh, it just gets phenomenal, and they air prune off. Um, in the Dutch buckets, the, my medium of choice is uh, very, very well rinsed. <laughs> well rinsed, <laughs> the stuff gets everywhere. Uh, it, well rinsed per light. That is my favorite medium inside the Dutch buckets. Uh, but in pots, whether I'm, you know, yeah, just in pots, I always choose cocoa. Great. Now, what have you found? Um, this is a two part question. What have you found to be the most easiest to grow hydroponically? And what have you found to be the most difficult? I think the absolute easiest thing, <laughs> the absolute easiest thing to grow, uh, which I grow a lot of every year, <laughs> is tomatoes. You know, it, it, it's just one of those things that's so darn forgiving, you know. Uh, and, it, and it just seems to really want to grow for people. And that's something I encourage everyone to try because it's almost a, a non, you, you, you almost can't fail, you know. That, for me, that's the easiest. The hardest thing uh, that I've grown hydroponically uh, was eggplant. Uh, they do very, very well. Uh, in fact, they take over. But they were really, really different uh, different to grow. They, they, they just seem to, uh, they they fed more than anything I've ever seen feed. I mean, uh, I was putting nutrients in there at 1,800 parts per million, and uh, they still wanted more, but they were very, very finicky for me. For our listeners who have never dabbled in the art of hydroponic, uh, for a beginner, what would you? What would be the best advice that you could offer them uh, to get into uh, the, the hydroponic world? Guys, I would, I would recommend um, watching as much as you can see uh, you know, on YouTube, uh, instructional videos, listen to people talk about it, uh, go to libraries, uh, the garden centers, there's always books. I, I know I know where I work, we've got several books on it. But, you know, books are a really, really, really good way to go. I, I read, gosh, I read Dog on, oh, I think everyone and, and everything on it uh, when I was getting into it. So I would really, really recommend books so that you can at least get a really basic understanding of what's going on so that when you are kind of attempting it, you'll, you know, you'll at least kind of have some handrails to kind of walk with for a bit. But I would say, you know, get, get some sort of a book. Or, you know, the Internet is, I guess, a super large book, <laughs> which is a wonderful source of information. But, you know, I find a good old paper book is really nice because I can flip through the pages, go back and, you know, I'm well, I guess I'm 63. I like the old paper books. <laughs> well, Brock, we greatly appreciate you taking time out of your day to come on the program, share your knowledge with hydroponics. Uh, it, it really means a lot to us. Well, I, I tell you, I, I'm, I'm honored you, you asked me on. I, I just tickled pink. Uh, I, I follow you guys all the time. So, you know, thank you so much uh, for, for having me on. And if I could just say one last thing to everybody, uh, uh, something I mean from the bottom of my heart, and that's please, above all things, just be good to each other, guys. Brock Hughes, Hydroponics at Home, YouTube channel. That link will be in the show notes below. If you have any inkling about growing hydroponically, definitely check out his channel. He's a very knowledgeable in individual who is able to, at least, if not answer your question, get you a resource that can. Brock, thank you very much. 
Thanks so much, guys. Bye-bye. And we'll be right back after these messages. A gardener knows that the key to a good plant is its roots. With poor roots, the end result is not good. Conventional pots and trays cause roots to wrap around and become root-bound. Then you try to unwrap the roots at the time of planting, hoping not to break them. But never again with the Root Maker, a non-chemical innovation that naturally air prunes roots to create more vigorous roots. Never a root-bound plant again. Whether trees, flowers, or edibles, home gardener or commercial grower, more roots means healthier, more productive plants. To get your own, visit RootMaker.com. you say you say nasala kombucha it'll put some glide in your stride and some pep in your step nasala kombucha <laughs> yeah nasala kombucha makes your body It's Joey. And Holly Bear. Of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Podcast. Taking a moment to remind you that you can sign up for a weekly email so you don't miss anything that we do. Our podcasts, our videos, our digital quarterly magazine. You won't miss anything by signing up. You just go onto our website on the right hand side. There's a, a big button for you to press. Just go ahead and sign up right now. And you can also ask us questions underneath that big green button. There's a big red button. So sign up for our emails for free. No spam, and if you've got a question, you can send us that as well. WisconsinVegetableGardener.com for the health conscious organic gardener worldwide. Hi, this is Dave Ledoux from BackToMyGarden.com. Discover your passion for gardening. You're listening to two of the greatest gardeners in the world, Holly and Joey Baird, on the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener podcast. Welcome back to the program. If you would like to check out, we encourage you to check out those sponsors that you've just heard in our entire sponsor lineup. See if they have something to offer you that helps you in your garden and just in general to make gardening more enjoyable. Don't close the window out yet. Don't turn the podcast off. We've got two more important topics to cover before we get out of here this week. First one is gardening in two minutes, and then we're going to talk about when is the right time to harvest your tomatoes. Seems like a simple uh, question and a simple answer, but there's more to it. Gardening in Two Minutes is an audio production that Holly and I produce on a weekly basis for several podcasts and a few radio programs. If you would like Gardening in Two Minutes on your particular program, you can contact us through the website. This Gardening in Two Minutes is all about alternatives to all-purpose flour. This Gardening in Two Minutes is sponsored by OurDailySalt.com. Chef Felicia Wiles knows what you need in the kitchen. Handcrafted kitchen accessories and tools for the professional chef and the home cook. To find out all of the wonderful tools and accessories that Chef Felicia Wiles has made, you can find all that information on her website, ourdailysalt.com, shipping the United States and international. And here is Gardening in Two Minutes. This is Gardening in Two Minutes. When it comes to baking, there's more choices out there than just plain old all-purpose flour and healthier choices in that. When you cook with or bake with plain white all-purpose flour, it's not necessarily a bad thing. There's a, a time and place for it, especially in a cake or in certain desserts, because that's all that's what is preferable. But in situations where you're baking other things, like bread or cookies or some sort of snack, it's a good idea to think about using a different type of flour. These type of flours usually will provide more fiber for you, more nutrients, and just a a heartier substance for you to have in your whatever you're making. You can also use these alternatives to flour to, or to the all-purpose flour to do things like coat things, um, and then to thicken things as well. So, for example, when I make gravy, I use spelt flour as opposed to white flour. I know it's going to add a little bit. You can't really taste it because you're going to add the the stock or whatever, the cream to it anyway. But you can um, definitely see that it's, it's a different color and it's going to add more nutrients. So there's different alternatives. There's also gluten-free things like nut flours, and those are grain-free as well. So like almond flour hazelnut flour, coconut flour, 
I make a really great waffle that is made with coconut flour and eggs, so it's grain free. A lot of people are turning to this because they're trying to have less grains and they're trying to have less gluten. For more information on alternatives to bleach flour, all-purpose flour that is, our weekly video productions as well as our free downloadable digital quarterly magazine, you can find all that information at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com. For the health conscious organic gardener worldwide. For gardening in two minutes, I'm Joy Baird. And I'm Holly Baird. So there's always interesting information when it comes to cooking in the kitchen, as you've just heard. Just don't always go for that what you're used to type of flour. There's a lot, the other flours have a lot of great flavor to them. Mm -hmm. So before we get out, let's talk about it's that time of year, and some of you who uh, have are a little farther south than us may have already be harvesting tomatoes. But when is the right time to harvest your tomatoes? You would think, hey, when it's ripe and red. Well, that that is one of the correct answers. This has this is one of those multiple correct answers. You know, fill in the blank uh, or A B C multiple choice, multiple all answer. Of the above. Yeah. So, yeah, so, so one one of all one first of all, tomatoes are not all red. We all know no. that. Most of us who are gardeners know that there is virtually every color of the rainbow type mm -hmm. of tomatoes. Okay. Now that that's out of the way. So why is it Joey, important that we know when? to harvest them? Well, we don't always harvest the tomato at the peak of ripeness, bring it in, eat it, or process it right away. Some of you do. That's great. But many of us, or at least us, let's talk about us, because I know what we do. We'll harvest the tomato, and we may not be able to get to the processing part of that that particular day. So you can harvest them a little earlier and allow them to ripen on your counter or in a plastic or in a paper sack. Also, by harvesting them early, and, and the way you figure this out is you're gonna have to look underneath the bottom of the tomato. Tomatoes ripen from the bottom up. Mm -hmm. So once you see that pigmentation of the skin changing, then you can go ahead and harvest. Obviously, if you wait for it to get riper or uh, whatever color it's going to be, whether it be red, purple, uh, black, green, yellow it's going to ripen quicker once you bring it inside. Then you can go ahead and harvest it. Now this also brings up that important part of the equation, knowing the type of tomato that you have planted. For example, green zebra doesn't get red. It no. gets green, dark green lightning bolts basically mm -hmm. on the side of it. Mm -hmm. There is a red zebra tomato as well, so that's a different, it has dark red stripes with a red base to it. Or there's a pink brandy wines that look like uh, they just look like underripe tomatoes. Kind right. Of. Yeah. So knowing when that is, and, and also if you have problems with animals in your area, pests, uh, varmints, uh, raccoons, birds, squirrels, neighbor kids, or neighbors, what you can do is harvest them early and bring them in. Raccoons are known for this. They'll come in and, and see a ripe tomato or birds are this, and they'll investigate and they'll peck holes in it, or the coons will rat, uh, knock them off the vine and, and kind of squash them and everything. That's not good either. So, you know, that's another way, another reason to know what you've got and being able to harvest it early. Right. Um, yeah, so that's a, a good point is, is that reason. Also, um, like you said, because maybe you, you're not going to be able to eat everything right away. At least you have them on reserve or uh, ready to, you know, for canning. Um, number one rule, number one rule about harvesting tomatoes, never, ever put them in the fridge. No. Never, what, what happens? They, they, they quit, they, they, there's a, a chemical, there's a, a natural chemical reaction that happens inside that tomato to where it tastes rubbery. Mm -hmm. It tastes horrible. We've all had store-bought tomatoes. Right. The, 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 the horrible mm -hmm. things, which would, you, you, you would actually get one, most likely more nutrient value and taste out of a piece of wet cardboard than you would out of a store. Well, no. The, the traditional big box store yeah. tomato. I'm yeah. not talking about the hydroponic tomatoes yeah. or the the greenhouse tomatoes or this, the farmer market tomatoes. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about that yucky red tomato yeah. that you get on your sandwich at the fast food store, yeah. a fast food restaurant, uh, that, that type. Mm -hmm. Okay? Where it looks really sad. Where it looks sad. It, it's still green. Yeah. Okay? So... Harvesting, and every one of you who garden, who, who grows tomatoes, you have your own technique of when to harvest them. You know by experience 
when the best time to pull them off the vine, whether it is at peak ripeness, before ripeness, or, or anywhere in between. Now, if you do come across a tomato that has exceeded its ripeness and it is squishy inside, it, it's basically rotting on the vine, okay? This is an opportunity to where you can actually save the seeds for that particular tomato. There's many resources online as well as on our website, and we will provide a link in the show notes for that episode of how to save tomato seeds. Because this is a trait that you can pass, you can, you can take the characteristics of that plant in your particular growing area, your growing zone, your garden, climatize them seeds, and then you're able to save them and grow them year after year, and they become more um, stronger than they did the year before. So just because that tomato is overripe, you've missed it, doesn't mean you need to throw it in the compost pile. Mm -hmm. You can save them seeds. There's hundreds and hundreds of seeds in a tomato that you can save, pass out, whatever the case is. There are some steps that you have to go through in order to get these seeds to be saved properly. But it is well worth the effort when you can carry on those traits of the tomato from year after year. We appreciate you tuning in to the program. We value your attentiveness and thank you very much. Feel free to share this information with any of your gardening friends or those who are thinking about getting into gardening. For the audio on the program, we use two websites, audioneutronics.com and freesfx.co.uk UK to royalty-free and copyright-free websites that we use to help liven up the podcast. Yes, also the music for Nasala and Paradigm Gardens is provided by themselves. In addition to dollarseed.com. Until next time, I'm Joy Baird. And I'm Holly Baird. And we will see you in the garden. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Podcast is a production of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener.com for the health conscious organic gardener worldwide and distributed in association with WI Garden Media.